Welcome to the March 11th IWWG bi-monthly open mic. I'm Kelly Dumar with the International Women's Writing Guild. I'm so excited to welcome everyone here today for our featured reading with poet Lita Brown, which is beginning now. And I, the first thing I'm going to do is give me one second to do a little arrangement. I'm going to play something for us. Oops, that's not it. Okay, forgive me the technical controls. It was set up, but then Zoom erased what I needed. They replaced the link that I had already saved. Okay, so I'm getting there. Thank you for your patience. And do we need somebody to mute there? I think we do need some more muting there when you get a chance, Katarina, hearing some background stuff. Oh dear. Isn't that amazing? The trailer to Flita's book, to Flita's book. Yeah. All right. I could not resist sharing that with you. It's not only forthcoming, it is here. I am so pleased and happy to introduce to you our featured reader guest today, Flita Brown. Flita has won the Felix Pollock Prize, a Pushcart Prize, the Philip Levine Prize, and the Great Lakes College's New Writers Award. And she's twice been a finalist for the National Poetry Series. She's Professor Emerita at the University of Delaware, where she taught for 27 years. She was Poet Laureate of Delaware from 2001 to 2007. She now lives with her husband, Jerry Beasley, in Traverse City, Michigan. I want to tell you, I wanted to say just one or two things um, uh, that other people have said. I want to repeat a couple of things that other people have said. Linda Paston has written. Flita Brown has such a wide ranging intelligence, such a large and quirky variety of subjects and such facility with language that you come away from her poems amazed at the emotional impact under the entertaining and colloquial surfaces. Dabney Stewart writes, cast in an impressive variety of forms, Flita manages her signature magical metamorphoses, poetry skying at its best, yet somehow, never leaving the ground it rises from. Now, the book is called Flying Through the Hole in the Storm. Golda Meir once said, so this is from her publisher, old age is like a plane flying through a storm. Once you're aboard, there's nothing you can do. The poems in Fleeta's brave collection, her 13th, take readers on a journey through the fury of this storm. There are plenty of tragedies to weather here, both personal and universal. The death of a father, a child's terminal cancer, the extinction of bees and environmental degradation. But her poems are wise, honest, and deeply observant meditations on contemporary science, physics, family, politics, and aging. With tributes to visionary artists, including Frida Kahlo, Pablo Picasso, and Grandma Moses, as well as to life's terrors, sadnesses, and joys, these works are beautiful dispatches from a renowned poet who sees the shadows lengthening and imagines 
what they might look like from the other side. Um, I have a note about something that um, Stephen Dobbin said. I can't see where the I put it at this point. Hold on one second. Oh, I can't see it. All right. So if these poems are manna, if they are accidental and wonderful surprises that spiritually feed us, I want you to be thinking about that. Hi, Lynn Barrett, we'll let you in. Um, thinking about how maybe something that Fleeta is sharing in her poetry with us today is something that we might consume ourselves as spiritual food. So that's something to be looking for. Fleeta, I welcome you. We look forward to hearing you. If you would unmute now, I'm so happy to have you here and we'd love to hear what you have to say. Thank you, Kelly. This is actually a book launch. I didn't, hadn't expected it to be a book launch, but the book is being released by the press tomorrow. So uh, that was kind of a big kick that it all happened at the same time. I'm going to read eight poems and that'll be about 15 minutes and then we will have some time to talk. So I wanted to start with the first poem in the book because it's kind of basically, it's an invocation. And uh, I guess, you know, not very many people think of moths as an invocation, but that's how it turned out. Come moths. Come, moths, to the sticky triangular tents I have placed in the closet, in the pantry. Come down with your tiny paper wings and brown anonymity. Come, uncatchable loose flecks of the universe. Come, smudges. Come, floaters in the eye. Mispunctuated sentences. Misappropriated funds. Gather into the dark. Let me be free of holes in the weave. Let me be free even of the idea of mistake. Come moths to your natural doom and I to mine, for you have already eaten through what I had chosen to wear, what I had hoped. You have made me see the light. Now we are together in this, finishing each other pro and con. So, that's the way it starts. And then, <laughs> thank you. It is just wonderful to see everybody. I just, I have to say, I just dearly love Zoom because I can see people that I haven't seen in a long time. And that's really, that is so great. Um, so I wanna read the second poem in the book. I'm not gonna go through the whole book poem by poem, but the second one, I just kind of felt like I wanted to read. It's called Wakened by Crows. Um, when we're at the lake, we're almost always wakened by crows. In the woods, the sky of our sleep breaking piece by piece. Nothing visible in the leaves but the blackness moving gradually off as light starts to ping back no. its notice. My father would call and the crows would answer and he'd stand there like a boy, shit grin delighted, call, call. Caw, caw, this is left, this is left of the old life is what he heard. You could see it in his eyes. He shot a crow once for no reason, he said, and he cried at its dense black, its perfectly curved beak. I was a child listening, waiting to be seen, but it was only the calling and the voice was air and the air was nothing human and I was standing under the pines and hemlocks, how hard it was, this is what I want to say, to wake from that disappearing, to answer the old life with this one. Um, I, uh, we're still at the lake in my mind here, I guess, and uh, uh, one of the things that ends up happening when we're at the lake with lots and lots of uh, grandchildren at time at, at different times is we end up playing Monopoly. And as anybody who knows me at all knows, I can't stand to play Monopoly. 
So, you know, it's what you do for your grandchildren. You play Monopoly. So there's this poem called Afternoons at the Lake, and it ends with uh, a, a reference to Keats. You have to remember his poem, When I Have Fears That I May Cease to Be, and the end of that poem, Till Love and Fame to Nothingness Do Sink. So that shows up uh, at the end of the poem. Afternoons at the Lake. I would rather be trapped in an attic with rats than play Monopoly all the afternoons it takes to lose the last of my money to the already super rich 1% grandchild to line up cheap green houses on my low rent Baltic and Mediterranean avenues in a futile attempt to collect enough to survive the next round of rent on boardwalk or park place to feel pitiful gratitude when I receive for services $25. Everything will be gone, save the smallest denominations. The Asian crayfish will overrun the native. The autumn olive will proliferate. The tallest thing will grow taller, will be layered with gold, will turn to gold, will harden its gold heart. It will squander jet pocket dole, win past wanting to win, dig the mine shaft, the ore, eat up the hillside, the birds, the whales, crack the foundations of houses, force the defaulters into the street. Dice will land as they will, will cause the tiny car to bounce happily from St. James Place to Indiana Avenue. A galaxy of gobble will enable the placement of flamboyant hotels on the coast where waters wash with exquisite music shoreward, all of it owned by the God who dwells inside the winning, who has not said otherwise yet, who owns free parking and jail, who owns the treeless board, the classy neighborhoods, as well as the ones with the rats and smashed out windows the new murderous sprawl of languages on walls, the smiling God holding the center with top hat and cane as I at last step out on the dock with my coffee and say to myself the lines where Keats rhymes think with nothingness do sink. You probably think I'm drinking something uh, that I'm not. <laughs> it's it's lemon juice and and um, uh, lemon and uh, honey. That's what it is. Um, so why, when I was working on this book, it was really <laughs> somebody commented, "Drink whatever you like." <laughs> um, I when I was working in the last couple of years, there have been spells when I just could hardly could hardly work at all. And somehow out of that came some very tight uh, prose poems. And I can't explain exactly why, but um, a lot of things happened in the last couple of years. Um, my father died and um, my stepdaughter's cancer came back, stage four, and just a lot of things, a lot of things. So I wrote a series called treatises, uh, one after the other. Um, none of them really connected except the connecting thread that, that keeps running through is um, the death of my father. I'll read the first one, that's all. And one th another th thing to mention is that you, you won't notice this because you'll only hear one of them, but I keep bringing back some of the same images. The first one starts on butterflies and the butterflies show up at various places through the whole series. On butterflies, I have not seen a butterfly yet this spring. There are fewer and fewer, yet I can send you a text message with many little blue ones in a row. King Midas in the Greek legend turned everything he touched to solid gold, which turned out to be not so good if you wanted a drink of water or if you longed for a real butterfly's airy flutter at the edge of your sight, if you longed for the spiritual world. It's good to remember that the spiritual world was first made out of chewed leaves, then suspended like a chrysalis, like a dream for a great long while before it knew what it had become. 
that is like this grief since my father died. Who knows how long I will hang here or if what comes next will be any improvement. Who said the butterfly is more spiritual than the worm anyway? Is it better to fly than to crawl? I have so many questions being stuck here as I am. It feels as if my father is fluttering at the edge of my sight, but that's the habit of my mind. No single butterfly completes a long migration. Sometimes it takes six generations. He was lying there pale as a statue, which is the dying phase of living. Some people see a butterfly and think it is their beloved dead sending a message from beyond. When one phase is over, I think it is natural to start looking around to see what kind of outfit life is going to be wearing next. Well, if that isn't um, uh, sad enough, I will read one called Ode on Sadness. Uh, I wrote a, several odes and uh, uh, I have maybe two or three in the book. Ode on Sadness. I am not sad for now. It is a lovely evening with stars. I can be philosophical since I feel more optimistic. One way to alleviate sadness is to weave and reweave like Penelope. In other words, concentrate on the small picture. Stuffed bears. When the children fly to their fathers for the summer, you can make perfect museums of their rooms, bears poised on their beds. Yet sadness remains a big floater in the eye. Even on a cruise, one looks out over the sea and thinks, life is short, shouldn't I be happier? How happy is happy? I invited my secret boyfriend, Jay, to the junior high Sadie Hawkins Day sock hop deliriously happy, yet sad that he might have said yes out of duty or kindness. That tension all night, a bow drawn over strings. Also, how could Penelope have been entirely sad with all those milling suitors? Really? Not one caught her eye? For that matter, the couple in the all-night cafe in the hopper painting, are they happy or sad? They could be planning a tryst or just come from one. Trist is homonym for triste, which used to mean sad. The light in that cafe is the saddest light in the universe, enclosed, too bright, too much exposed. Yet I'm trying to hold sadness to the light because I have felt my heart get so heavy, the air has stopped to wait. Even thus, even then, I have to say, there was a shimmering like stars inside the sadness, a delicacy, a sense that I could almost touch what no one could understand but me. Okay, slightly different tone, um, but again, more anguish. <laughs> um, I had just had meniscus surgery and come, I was coming home from the hospital and uh, I had to use a walker because I had just, uh, because I was, you know, just coming home. And at the same time, my husband, Jerry, was just getting over uh, hip surgery and he um, also was using a walker. Now you try to imagine somebody with a walker helping somebody with a walker get home from the hospital. And uh, uh, my, our good friends, uh, Joanne and Myrna, were here to help us get up to the condo. But anyway, uh, this, this poem is, is about that. It's called Stalking the Wild. You should have seen us scooching from the car with our walkers, me from knee surgery, him from the accumulations, the back, the hips. By you, I don't mean anyone in particular, only the you that means someone should be witness to what happens, witness to the tender return, the determined positioning, the elevator ride. Who would have thought is another way to say it. No high drama, no wailing wall, only the slow burning aches that bear our names 
and ride to the third floor where we head toward the door, leaning like two pigeons caught in a wind, greeted by Wally the cat on his back, his expanse of white belly waiting to be rubbed if we could reach down far enough. We both wish to inform you that the situation has become absurd, absurd. Surely you recall, we want you to recall, Tarzan and Jane calling out across the vines, wild animal thrills, Johnny Weissmuller lock of hair across his brow like an impulsive boy's cavalier. Who doesn't love cavalier and what lies under it, the lone, the arch presentation? We'd like to see you try it yourself with your two hands on the walker's handles, wa watching to lift over the dangerous oriental rug. Witness now, as your eyes must adjust to a fainter light, what you're in for, the unexplored, the ruins, the behemoth and leviathan, good God, the cooling of magma beneath the forest floor, the mad crack in the earth's mantle, and the small triangle of the rug's corner caught like a lapping tongue. I wanted to read you uh, one of the other sec prose poem sections. This is a different prose poem. It's called 20 Letters in Spring, and there are 20 separate sections. And uh, so I'm, what I want to read for you is the second section in here. It's called Wednesday, May 15th. Now, this, this particular long section of prose poems would not have existed, I don't think, without my friend Sid Lee, who happens to be here, although I can't see him at the moment. Um, and uh, because I was, I was just at the point that I just couldn't write anything, just nothing. It just seems like one thing after another had happened and I just felt absolutely unable to write. So I emailed Sid and I said, if you would just take what I, I'm going to send you something every day and it may just be nothing. I don't know what it's going to be, but I don't need any critique. I don't want you to do anything except just acknowledge that you got it. And apparently it was extremely helpful to me just to know that a real person uh, that I respect was out there listening. I didn't have to, to get any kind of feedback at all. I just, and so all of this stuff just kept pouring out one after the other. It was like I, I had all this pent up energy and, and it started coming out in this it's 20 letters in spring. So here's one. This is Wednesday, May 15th. The day she told us her news, the wildflowers were more than an antidote. I can't tell you exactly. They were tipping themselves into me with their cups, trillium, Spring peepers, trout lilies, false Solomon seal, Dutchman's breeches, squirrel corn. I walked the entire trail trying to remember the name of the one that was blooming in abundance. It's droopy yellow, fringed at the bottom like a ballet skirt. You know, you know, that one. As if you could help me piece together what's needed, names instead of grief. Once all has been named, at least there will be that. Cancer is never quite, just under, just along the periphery. It sends out runners, can send. There were the flowers. I tilted up a few blooms. I looked into their faces. I was like a crazy woman looking into their faces, wanting nothing but evidence of their existence. I had no self. My mouth was their mouth. We weren't sending messages. We were too far under the surface for that. The trout lily leaf tasted like snow peas. Everything tasted like everything. So I have one more poem and I was thinking about the sequence of these poems and realized, boy, at this point, I better give you one called joy. So, so that's, that's what the last one is. And it started with my studying uh, a painting by Mary Cassatt. You may know this painting, it's called The Boating Party. And I was, I was looking at it very closely and I realized everything was wrong. Uh, for anybody who sails knows that everything is wrong in, this pic in, in the boating party. And so that's how I started the poem, Joy. 
what a mess. In Mary Cassatt's The Boating Party, the woman holding a baby while the rower is rowing, even though the sail is filled and he's facing the wrong way and the waves are washing all directions. Nothing's one-sided. For example, two robins out there are acting exactly like robins and chickadees keep scrupulously tapping at the feeder. Nothing wrong or right. My mother's still alive and not the way it is when you can't help it, which is always. The chipmunk she calls Chippy dashes out, then stows himself under the porch. Years conflate into a wonder smashing glory. Nothing to be done. No matter what, you've got stones, buds, and shrubs, hills tumbling over each other, sun on this side naming the shade, each banking against the sky, coming in for a landing. And my mother is still in the rowboat. How she loved to be rowed. I, at least, the bearer of that comfort, though some recollections can scarcely be endured. They are so laced with terror and awe, so each and neither. Yet she is dragging her hand in the sparkles, joy for once at her command. Thank you. Wow, wow, thank you. Uh, that is, wow. Um, I don't mean to be speechless. I've got some ideas about questions, but um, that was so deeply moving, Flita. It's really, I could sit and listen to you so much longer. Um, I don't see a lot of questions in the, um, in the chat room, but I, I'll encourage you to, to offer a couple if you want. I do see a lot of brilliant reading, beautiful poems, lovely, um, and all of that. I do have a few questions. Recognizing sort of the um, limitations of our time with you, I think I want to kind of cut to one of the questions that um, may seem weird, but um, you've got, you've, this is your 13th book. And I'm, I'm, I'm marveling at that. I'm admiring of that. I'm a little bit astonished at that. I'm thinking <laughs> oh what a wonderful thing, what, what a wonderful thing to have that many books of poetry behind you. So um, I'm curious about how these poems are different, if they are, from ones you wrote in your earlier decades of writing, in the beginning of writing? That question I ponder off and on. I think uh, the main thing I can say is that I think they're a lot richer. Uh, I think I pack a lot more in and move in a lot different directions. Um, uh, I don't know, it's sort of what happens when you've been writing for a long time, you just, uh, you, there's, well, to begin with, when you're older, there's more of you. And there, and you, you, that more gets into the poems a lot of times. But I think I've, I've, I've learned something about listening at a deeper level, so that a lot of things that run through my mind I don't lose as easily. I, they, I'm able to to hold on to them enough to to make them work in the poem. I, I don't know. Well, I, I must say I do think that you pack a lot in, and it all seems really relevant, and it all seems like. Oh, yes, I'm so glad she saw that in there too for me. You know, so I think that is lovely. And there seems to be sort of an accretion of, of wisdom that you're then able to, to let happen more in, in your poems. Um, and uh, you're just a genius, genius, dear somebody, dear Fleeta, <laughs> dear FB. Um, my friend Sid, who said genius. <laughs> oh, wonderful, wonderful. Yes, I, I hear, hear. Um, okay, so I, in, in the very first poem, you read about the moths. I forget the title. Mm -hmm. Come on. You, the moth. Okay. Free of the idea of mistake, you wrote. And um, that made me wonder about doubt and this ability to move into a place, perhaps, as we grow, where we're just less preoccupied with the idea of making mistakes or the fear of that, or the concern about it, or anything else. And I, I was wondering, um, what did you worry about that you did not need to worry about? <laughs> what, 
What are they worried about that you did not in your poetry that you didn't need to be worried about? Oh, Looking back over 13 books, like. Oh, heavens, I don't know. You know, life is full of things to worry about. And, and um, I probably, you know, coming back to your first question, I probably used to worry a lot more about whether I could write anything. And in every poem, you know, I, we all, I, I don't know anybody who's been writing a whole lifetime who doesn't pick up, who doesn't sit down with a blank screen and think, oh my gosh, I can't, I can't do this again, can I? Uh, but their confidence kind of gets, um, you know, after a while you realize, well, if I did it all that much, that many times, it's going to come again. Even, even though, during those times when I just didn't feel like I could write anything. And I, I have a habit, I start to say a bad habit. I have a habit of thinking, oh Lord, I can never write anything again. Uh, and I don't know whether that's just typical or whether uh, it's just special to me, but I tend to, so worry had to do, you know, used to have to do with, I don't think, I remember between my first and second book, uh, I thought, the first one was a fluke and that nobody would ever want to publish another one. It was just a, a lucky fluke. And so, you know, you just kind of, after a while you think, well, they must have, it must have gone okay. And so maybe I can do it again. And so you just kind of keep thinking each time, maybe I can do it again. Yes, yes. Um, and so I'm curious also, someone asked about revision and um, what is your process with revision? Uh, the, older I get, the older I get, the longer I write, the, an awful lot of revision takes place in my head before it gets, you know, much to the paper. I'm, you know, um, but I, I, I don't know. I just keep, I just keep playing with it on the screen. I, back in the early days, I used to have to cut and paste uh, this is how old I am. I used to have to cut and paste strips of paper over the original poem and I'd get so many layers that it would just be like cardboard almost because I would be trying new lines and trying new lines, but at least now I can, uh, I can do that on the computer. And uh, so I don't know what my, I don't have a process. I just know what's, what seems like it's working and what sounds okay and, and where it's really sounding flat and Generally, I think if the sound is flat, it means there's something also wrong with where the poem's going. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah. and someone else is asking um, uh, about the butterfly. Nan is asking, was the butterfly theme through the prose poems after your father's death a deliberate choice early on or a theme that emerged as you continued to write? It was a theme that emerged as I continued to write. Yeah, there's several, several themes. One thing, you know, some, it's always good for me to have a, a kind of organizing principle. And if it's a prose poem and it seems to be um, kind of moving all over the place, even just hanging on to one image and carrying it through from poem to poem in, in the, the sections, provides a kind of, uh, uh, um, it helps the movement forward. And uh, it's almost like, you know, a crown of sonnets where one sonnet just just moves back, uh, picks up from the last one, picks up from the last one and so on. And so I, I just sometimes, I just make up devices that seem like they're gonna carry it forward. Well, that makes sense, but it also makes me wonder are you, are, so are you deliberately writing a book? Like at what point are you aware that you are writing a book versus writing poems? I don't, there's only one book I've ever written that I was deliberately writing a book. No, two, uh, The Devil's Child and the Elvis book, uh, The Women Who Loved Elvis All Their Lives. Those are the only two books that I set out and I said, this is gonna be a book. But other than that, um, no, I just, that scares me, you know, unless I've got some overarching theme that I think like the Elvis poems, I knew that I was going to just keep delving into different parts of Elvis's life and working with that. But on the, for the most part, I just want to deal with where I am right then with that poem. And I, I don't feel like I can, uh, I can get hold of a whole big thing. I was really interested in, um, 
how much your I was as I was admiring of your the prose poem you read. May, I think it's May fifteenth. The piece of that prose poem is that the title May fifteenth. Well, the, the title is uh, Twenty Letters in Spring of oh. the whole thing. Yeah. Oh. Yes, the part you were reading. Um, there was really no way for me as a listener to have been able to tell that's a prose poem. You know, I, I the idea of the um, it was uh, a remarkable poem and it didn't come to my ears as prose. It certainly came as, as poetry. Um, is this your first hybrid or have you been working with hybrid combinations before uh, connecting poetry, uh, prose poems and poetry? I have a few prose, prose poems in previous books, but not very much. I, I don't know, I just, for some reason, and I, I can't, don't have any explanation for it, but for some reason it just came out that way. I just felt like that's what I wanted to do. I really, I like prose poems. I, I don't think I would ever write a whole book of them, although I have no idea. Uh, uh, but there's something, um, there's something freeing about, about just sort of working without even, I mean, everything has a structure. And to say a prose poem has no structure, is is not the idea but the structure dropping the conscious line endings changes something about the tone something about the movement of the lines and um creates a whole different thing for me it feels different you know it may sound i hope it does sound like a poem i mean but it doesn't sound like a lineated poem i don't think quite the same and um, uh, well, do you decide or know in advance or have you found that your prose poem is growing because the lineation isn't working, it's not appealing to you, you're feeling like, eh, it's not really fitting into a lineated poem, so it must be prose. Or the sense that I'm gonna start this, it's a prose poem, I'm gonna really create a prose poem versus a lineated poem. Um, I don't think I, well, this is one of the huge advantage, of course, of having a computer that I can play. Sometimes something starts out one way and I get halfway through it and I think, no, it really needs to be uh, couplets. It really needs to be triplets. It really needs to be a prose poem. So I just, I just start with whatever's in my head and, and start working with it. And I don't know when I start what the shape's going to be. Although it's funny, I think somewhere way back in the back of my head, there's this little voice that's saying, you really know what shape it's going to be. You really do. You're just not admitting it yet. I'm not sure that's true, but it kind of feels true. Okay. But you've got that, you got that voice. So it's so wonderful to hear you talk about the voice in your head and remind us sometimes those voices, when we don't listen to them, they, they're there and they can really help us. Um, so, um, you know, I, I appreciate your sort of willingness to, to talk a lot about craft because as a writing organization, you know, we um, were particularly interested in craft. And I know that um, one question people typically ask a lot about is, well, I'm putting together my chapbook. Um, I'm curious about your own process with ordering the sequencing. You did actually refer to sequencing. And um, I think this will probably be my last question, but Listeners may be interested into this idea of your choice making with sequence and um, what's your approach to deciding how am I putting this book together? Oh, that is a great question. I, uh, and besides that, I just want to say all your questions have been really good questions. Um, I used to spread all the pages out on the floor. You know, I'd spread everything out and I'd start moving them around. And I still do a little bit of that. Sometimes I just get stuck and have to do that. But sometimes I'm able to do it on the computer now, not quite as easily. Uh, but I don't, I can't tell you exactly. I don't know. Uh, I, I start putting one in front of the other. I did know that I wanted the moth poem at the beginning. And I have one called the, the Weeping Alaskan Cedar. And I knew that should be the ending poem. And then I just sort of um, just kept fitting them where that seemed like the next move would be. I did divide it into sections and each section has an epigraph, which kind of helps. It helps me to figure if that epigraph is going to mean something to this group of poems, then I need to make sure that this group of poems 
somehow that epigraph speaks to those. So that's one thing that I can do. And you knew you wanted the epigraphs uh, deliberately because it does, but you put those in at the end? No, uh, I don't know when I put them in. I might've put, put them in. That was one of your organizing principles was. It, it was, uh, it, I might've put them in and then gone back and reorganized to, uh, to make the book uh, speak to those epigraphs or I might have I can't remember what I put them in I don't know I haven't seen I haven't seen the actual book yet but I think that actually it makes me wonder did you keep the epigraphs in or you know it, it's actually kind of an interesting idea the idea of put the epigraphs in and then take them away before you publish maybe they would help you organize it even if you don't end up getting the permission <laughs> to use those particular epigraphs no, I like the epigraphs. I like epigraphs because they tell me something about what I'm going to find. And it, and it may be obscure. It may be um, kind of not, uh, not anything that I see right away what makes the connection, but somehow, somehow it does. I haven't always used epigraphs, but uh, this book I wanted to. I don't know why. Well, I feel like I could um, ask you questions all afternoon, um, but I, I also do want us to have our open mic. And I also want to transition into this real exciting, um, this really exciting um, thing that we are uh, putting together with you for the International Women's Writing Guild. Talk about craft. Um, you have uh, offered to um, do an intensive webinar for the International Women's Writing Guild. And I'm gonna mention it now and put the link for registration in because Flita, we are limiting the registration um, right now to 15 people um, for this intensive with you called a poem stretcher. A poem stretcher intensive, making poems go wider and deeper, a three hour webinar with Flita Brown. And when I invited you to come in and do the featured talk, um, we did not know you were gonna do this, but um, we're really excited that it's actually coming out and you're, you're, you're going to talk and work with um, poems that are going to be written in the intensive section and then take on this question of stretching and making them go wider and deeper. So I just really wanna plug that because if you're interested in registering um, for all of you, it may be that um, registration is going to fill up. So I'll put that in the chat room. Um, you will get with your registration as well, a, a copy of Flita's book, um, uh, Flying Through the Hole in the Storm. So through a hole in the storm, I keep saying that, but it's a hole in the storm. So just to mention that that is going to be an opportunity for any of you. Uh, and, and I want to mention, since we are all here together, that is for those of you who've not yet ever written poems and those of you who are um, poets with a lot of experience, Flita has promised that she really wants to attend to the concerns and the development for a whole range of poets. So just please keep that in mind. I will be putting again in the chat room, the link to buying your book and to your website. Um, and now it's time for you to hear the people that we have lined up in our open mic. And I thank you. I'm actually going to turn the recording off. Um, recording, stop the recording.